So I've got a damaged knee, so I have to work out how to get up here comfortably. <laughs> I'm all right when I'm in position. I don't have to leap off with the cramp <laughs> or fall off. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arado Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arado Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arado Sama Sambuddhasa Badhang Damang Sankhang Damasami I'll try not to keep you too long. <laughs> it only seems a few weeks ago I was up here before, it's just getting in the habit. <laughs> Very funny because even though I'm a person who chatty and people friendly, I tend to, um, when it comes to my practice, as I often say, is basically watch your mind and get on with it. <laughs> you know, I haven't got big ideas and things like that. And I don't really plan a lot. I did think today, oh, perhaps what should I think about? What should I talk about? And what came to mind um, was first, my favourite simile. I'm going to try and stay on track with my, my mind that go, tends to go into floating off into all different directions. So I, I shall attempt to stay more on track. I only made my favourite simile, which is my own. Is I thought it was my own, and then I remembered a guru in the 1970s who I quite I liked uses it, and that's the Clint Fist, the hand. You know, like I always say, uh, body, feeling. Um, perception, content of, no, not content of mind, what is it? Feeling, perception, feel, body, feeling, perception, conception, consciousness. <laughs> and then, this is sense of self. And our job is, we gently learning to do this, so that we have Body, feeling, perception, conception, consciousness, space, <laughs> spaciousness. And then I remembered this, I suddenly remembered, oh, there's this guru in the 1970s who was very, very big, American. He was a brilliant mind. But, and, um, so there was all rumours about him, but he was quite a brilliant mind. I always used to use this. I suddenly remembered it. Oh, he always used to do this fist. You know, self-contraction. He was always talking about self-contraction. We contract into self. And then the idea is this. It's very beautiful. I think it's a really good simile. Then I thought of a... So you remember the thing? Um, must, must probably older members might have heard these stories, but... Um, I think that Joseph Goldstein, who for me is is really the lion of the, the lay Buddhist community in America, a very great lay teacher. And he, I always tell little stories and things. And he tells this Zen Zen story, and this suddenly came to mind today. And uh, because I've been away without going out into, I've been with my family for a week. And then, because I've seen television, so I've seen a lot about diversity, inclusivity, general madness, <laughs> wars, and God knows what. Not that God has anything to do with it. 
They always blame God. Everybody blames God. Terrible things happen. I saw. A be- oh, I won't go into it. <laughs> I saw a very beautiful talk by a rabbi who was in uh, Auschwitz, and uh, he uh, he said people say, "Why God? God isn't in Auschwitz? What's his God? God?" And uh, he starts to talk. He said, "God has nothing to do with it. He created us. It's what we do, you know." And then he tells these stories of miracles that occurred to him in Auschwitz and as a child of seven how his life was saved by really quirky things anyway I might mention that a bit later on because it's a nice couple of things he said very lovely stories but the thing uh, uh, Joseph Goldstein tells this thing of the man who's walking along with a Zen master and they're walking along chatting away and then there's this big old tree great big old tree growing away and the man says uh, that tree is just like your teaching he says it's big and useless and the Zen master says useless you should be so lucky nobody's planning on cutting it down he says the tall straight tree in the forest they cut it down because it's straight and useful for building he says the eucalyptus tree is used for its oil the rubber tree, I add the rubber tree because I've lived eight years in Sri Lanka, is scarred for the rubber. He said, everybody appreciate, seems to appreciate how useful it is to be useful and valuable. There's very few who appreciate how useful and valuable it is to be useless. He says, the old tree sits there, nobody's planned on cutting it down. It's all knotted and distorted and it just follows its own nature growing away and nobody takes any notice of it. And I think it's a very lovely simile for us, (laughs) for what we're learning, how to become useless, but useless in a wise way. There's a very nice Sufi book, not that I read a lot, but I, I tend to notice titles. I did notice the title years ago. It was a, a, by a book by this very famous guru called Compulsory Dancing. And it was on the cover was a two-seater settee with nobody on it. And I really liked it, you know, and it was a story of life. It's compulsory dancing. We're all here dancing. It's compulsory. You're either moving forwards or backwards. And you have to step right for the dance. And uh, But the Sufi book I like is called The Wisdom of the Idiots. <laughs> and, you know, it's a Sufi, the Sufi master who's... who's and he's similar to like, the, the, the joker, the clown in the Middle Ages. And he's the only one who can really ridicule the king and things like this. And the uh, Raja is on his way to conquer the next country or something like that and of course this Sufi man can and these generals and all that and the Sufi man can the idiot he can jump out and he can ridicule the king you know looking for empires and things like this and there's very lovely and in actual fact at my at my I'm just going off a little bit but I'll come back here. at my son's funeral his best friend played the guitar and he played a song called Hurt which is very famous, I think it's quite a hit at one time, and the lyrics, and the guy who played it at his funeral has a brain aneurysm, so he can actually drop dead at any time. So he played this song, and and this song, I've actually watched the video, (laughs) because it's very nice of Johnny Cash singing this song. It's not a Johnny Cash song, but Johnny Cash apparently saw it and said, oh, this is my song, this is, you know... When he was old, there's a lovely bit in it where there's a big long tape, table with all the glittery and all the fruit and all the possessions. And he picks up his glass of wine and he sings, you can have my empire, <laughs> my empire. I'll get a lump in my throat now, I'm getting emotional. It's <laughs> such a good song. He says, you can have my empire of dirt. Everyone goes away in the end. It's really, really neat song, you know. And, um, but anyway, as a side, 
And I was contemplating us, you know, when I, when I went to Thailand, in actual fact, I, I will divert, I try not to go on too much. It's a long subject, you know, diversity, inclusivity. You know, if you say the wrong thing, you'll end up getting hate mail. <laughs> you know, if you, if you put a foot wrong, but um, just in case anybody in the outside world, I say anything which is offensive. You can send me hate mail, but I don't care. I won't answer it. I don't give a hoot. <laughs> you insult me or hate me. Um, uh, where was I? I haven't been a dyslexia. has two qualities, as a curse and a blessing. The curse is that you can just go off and forget where you started. And the blessing is that your very spatial awareness, you, you go into a silence. You go into a silence which you get used to and you use. If you become a, a monk or a meditator, you use it as a skillful means. Um, yeah, so when I, I was in my family, in actual fact, my wife, I still say my wife, as many people know, I left my family, for the lay people, people don't know, I left my family when I was 40, and at 40, my wife's a devout Christian. She's a true Christian. She used to dance for our gents made her. He stayed at our house and loved the monks and all this sort of thing. But very devout. And uh, um, she never divorced me. And when we separated, we were in our late 30s. She was still very attractive, held a very responsible job, had a very nice house, converted barn type place, and quite well off. So she could have got married just like that, you know, but uh, she actually never divorced me, so I've always felt it quite insulting. Some people, some people in Shanka, you say, why do you say your wife, you're separate? And I say, I'm not going to say the woman I was married to, or to use a really common London expression, her indoors, <laughs> which is very insulting. I said, so I still say, wife, you know, we don't live together, we're like brother and sister. But we were talking, and uh, my family were there, my daughter, and then... Because she lives in a very beautiful, uh, quiet place. And the walls in her, place, her house is just thick, you know, so it's very... I, I, when I stay there, I stay in my little tent in the garden, which is very lovely, you know, so I go to my little tent. And uh, I was telling her that I went... Um, I kind of can't give this talk because some people, three gentlemen are going to become salmon heirs. So I'm just warning them now <laughs> what to expect. Um, I said, well, no, I was very comfortable. And then I was semi-retired. So in my 30s, I was very lucky. Um, so I used to spend most of my time under my apple tree meditating, you know, sitting there meditating. But I said there was just always something in me to go live outside of my comfort zone, be outside of my comfort zone. And so, but when I went to Thailand, getting on to the subject of diversity and inclusivity, inclusivity um, I remember I, I really have great respect for my Acharya, I won't say who it was, very great love and respect for him, but I remember being quite irritated once and we were sitting in a row, and he started telling us off a bit, being very Zen-like. And he said, you should be much more, you know, you're all Westerners, you're such a clumsy lot. You, know, you should be much more like the Thais, is right, Thai monks, all nice and refined, and all this sort of thing. And uh, I looked along the row, and I'm a bit of an old dog, so I can get, um, I don't identify with being a dog. Now, there are people around in these days who do identify as being dogs, I've heard, <laughs> I've seen. Um, th and uh, I thought, well, we're such a group, you know? There's an Israeli monk, German monk, French monk, you know, and we come from all different places and different works of life. Some people came in as a, one monk I lived with, he was an ex-punk, and I was an ex-mod-come-hippie-come-Buddhist come yogi, come Buddhist, so I was a lot older, so. And I thought, well, we've come here and there's mosquitoes, we can get 
Japanese encephalitis, we can get malaria, we can die. I've known someone with brain malaria, so it's very unpleasant. And there's snakes around, you know? And uh, actually, I think everybody actually deserves a medal. It's a wonder we're not all killing each other. <coughs> you know, that we get here and we all get on well and we've got this discipline that keeps us in line. So we, we do have our disagreements, but generally we're all working together from all different cultures and all that, which is diverse, all diverse cultures. And I think, you know, to now hound us, tell us, you know, we should be more refined and we're a clumsy old lot, messy and not got our robes on properly and all this sort of thing. I thought it was rather unkind, you know. And like in England now, you know, we're, we're such a group. This is, this is not only for monks, I'm giving this little talk, and monks and nuns, but lay people are the same. You know, I include everybody. We've, we've all got wisdom, we've all got a mind. We can all be mindful. So, but it's only that we're more of a concentrated group, is that we've all chose to live together. Yeah. We leave the family life. We be married with children and all that sort of thing. We leave one marriage and then we marry 40 other people. 50 at Amrawati, <laughs> including the people who live here. I mean, it's not an intimate relationship, but it's pretty intimate. Mentally, it's intimate. Because we can't, you know, when you're in a relationship with your kids, you can kind of snap at the wife or clip the kids around the ear hole. But I, I didn't, actually. I think I did push my son around once because I thought he was bullying another boy. Then when I found out he wasn't bullying the boy and he gave me this look, I can, st I can still feel guilty about hounding him because I said, this is what bullying's about. <laughs> and then he looked at me and I suddenly realised I made a mistake. And I can still think of that and get upset, get upset, you know. My daughter, I never, never hurt. My daughter told me in later life, I tell you not loose things about. Um, she told me later on that she used to do something naughty and then she would get it that my son got blamed for it. <laughs> and then when I told him off and I wasn't looking, she'd turn around to him and go... <laughs> <laughs> It's the sort of thing little girls do. Um, but anyway, so yeah, so we're in, you know, we live, we're in a relationship, all of us all together in monasteries and that. And spiritual seekers, whether we live in monasteries or whether we're spiritual seekers in lay people or anything like that, we're disciplining ourselves. We take on hopefully sila to develop samadhi and panya. <clears throat> and we are diverse, especially these days. People come from all over. You're all from all over the place. Exotic places. Japan. Russia, part Russia, part Czech. Americans, Dutch, my ancestors. Russian, oh, another Russian. Thai, French, all of us. And you've even got someone here from Luton. <laughs> and I think the two monks who went to Dong, they passed through Luton. Through Luton. They went to, they said, we went to a place, Marsh Farm. I said, oh, Marsh Farm. You all right? You didn't <laughs> this Marsh Farm used to have an, a reputation. When I was a little boy, the only thing you worried about in Marsh Farm was that some of the marsh was still there and we used to swim in the marsh and avoid the leeches. It was leech infested. So that was the danger of Marsh Farm. But it got quite dangerous in another way later on. Yeah, so we even got some of the exotic Marsh Farm area. <laughs> and they even got fed. They went to Dunstable and got fed in Dunstable. I was intrigued as to whether they would get fed in Luton Town Centre. So, yeah, so we're all from all different cultures. 
It's rather wonderful. And then we come here to watch our mind, you know, and to see how we react to each other. It's a very noble thing to do. Because outside, and I'm not saying the whole of all laity are like this, you know, some people lead very disciplined life. When I was in, when I was in uh, Thailand, one monk, one monk said, he always spoke, he'd come in from, the, he's a very dear friend now, a senior monk, he's not here, but he was kind of ex-punk. He'd always talk about people, oh, it's, oh yeah, like what he was like outside, he assumed outside it was just like he was, you know. And because I'd been a lay practitioner, I used, you know, I said, you know, there's people outside who don't actually need to come to a monastery. They've got a very disciplined practice. And, uh, you know, and I know such people. And I remember a, a man came from America who had, he was a cripple, paraplegic, and he'd been run over in a field by a tractor that made him paraplegic. But he became quite famous uh, meditation teacher. I forget his name now. But uh, one time he told me he came to visit and I was, I was with Ajahn Pasano and he was there. And he was saying, they're running this uh, death and dying retreat for a weekend. It was a weekend and I said, how many people attend? And he said, oh, about 300. <laughs> and I said to him, I said, you know, there's a monk who I would like him to be in this room now and hear you say this. <laughs> you know, because he's under the impression, you know, you're all kind of... Punks outside, <laughs> outside, because he was, you know, he took his projection of himself, you know, and then projecting it outward. But I think why are we di we are different outside. You you now have, and and I will I will get into the subject a little bit. That's not in a critical way. I believe in kind of accepting everybody, what everybody, what people identify with, or whether you, what you identify with, or want to be called, and then now have these 200 pronouns, you have to ask someone what's your personal pronoun. You know, a teacher got into trouble the other week because, a little while ago, because she wouldn't, she wouldn't respond to a child because he identified as a cat. So he, he, he demanded. So the teacher actually got into trouble because of it, you know. Um, but for me, if he wants to be a cat, that's fair off with me. So long as I'm not expected to buy into someone else's, <laughs> I'm dealing, I'm observing my own delusions without having to agree, made to agree with someone else's delusions. Um, the, but there's a difference with us, you see, people, people take on identities. There was a man, I saw a man a while ago, who identified, this is about, I mean, with all the different identities which are around now, but one I will agree with, was there was one man identified as a devil. He wanted to be a devil. So he'd had his whole body tattooed and the whites of his eyes tattooed black. And he looked like a devil. He'd had lumps put under his flesh and horns and everything. And I thought, <laughs> How embarrassing this man's going to be when he's about 80, you know, and he comes to his senses and looks at himself in the mirror like a, a great big wrinkled prune, all tattooed with horns and black eyes. As a woman identified as a lizard, her whole body is tattooed with scales and her face has been changed so she looked like a lizard. And a man who wants to be an alien and he's had himself totally desexed. <laughs> And all things removed, so he looks like an alien, you know. And people might say, well, you monks are the same, you identify, you identify the same. And they say, no, we're different. I would say, this was my the answer to that, is that we're different. Because we all dress the same, we dress different to the nuns. Though when I came back to Sri Lanka, my... my, my Robes were very dark, so when I used to come in here, one monk said, you should be over the other side. <laughs> I remember waving at the nuns, because I was in very dark robes. Um, we all dress the same, so we're in the same thing. You were always, you always, I mean, identified. But all these identities within ourselves, whether we think we're a Martian or a lizard or something like that, we observe within ourselves. Each one of us is in our own world, with our own perceptions, our own history. 
and our job, um, our robes, our robes point to not identification. We all, you know, we all, we try. I mean, I often try to get my robes a bit darker because I like dark robes. We've all got our personal preferences, which we're allowed within the limitation of our discipline. But our job is that we watch our all these inclinations within ourselves, and we're a symbol of that. Whereas, not everybody, but there's a big movement in the world now that everybody has to find out really what their identity and become their true authentic self, you know. And our true authentic self is to examine what is a true authentic self, <laughs> you know. And by doing that, we all dress the same, we all look the same, and we all act within a, a set of conditions which uh, induce more of this. Sometimes it's very difficult for those who are about to embark and change their whites to brown. I wrote once in a letter to my brother, I said, I feel I'm being crucified. This was years ago. I feel, well, I still feel I'm being crucified sometimes. But, uh, I said, I feel I'm being crucified, but the, the cross isn't made of wood. I'm being slowly crucified to the aesthetic. And what I mean by the aesthetic is that which is out of the static, out of the normal way of seeing things. Sometimes it's quite difficult. But then, as I said to my wife, I said there was this desire to, you know, I knew that if I went to Asia or became a monk, because I know there are people here who are aspiring in this direction, I knew that putting there, I was going into a situation where I would be faced with things that uh, I'd prefer not to be faced with. I actually had a centipede get in my sabong once, which frightened the hell out of me, because centipedes have got a very nasty bite. But, you know, I, I, had, I was lucky enough that this thing left me without biting me. But then it, it went to a very dear friend <laughs> who's sitting directly in front of me. <laughs> and uh, started to um, make a dinner of between two of his toes. But he, being a practitioner, was about five minutes towards the end of the patty, it's about five minutes, so still had the patty mocha to finish. And so he finished the patty mocha before I pointed and and he moved, and the centipede was <laughs> very unpleasant, very unpleasant. <laughs> but he's still with us, I'm glad to say. <laughs> yeah, so we, we come in, and then, yeah, we're watching our own minds, especially in a community, and we're all different. People often come on retreats, so I give a 10-day retreat, and you've probably heard all this, they always say, oh, I always feel like the odd one out, you know, I always feel a bit, and I say, yeah, you're completely unique, just like everybody else. We all feel like the odd one out. <laughs> we all feel we've all got a separateness about us until we, you know, until we, we've seen through all this. And then there's people we, we perhaps get on with, people we don't get on with or have problems with and things annoy us. We have our duties and people have to put up with me as well. I'm a noisy old thing and a bit nutty. But slowly and gradually, hopefully, it all gets sorted out. When we first come into it, we think we're going to get rid of all our problems and uh, things like that, but it doesn't mean that uh, we, we get rid of our personality or anything like that. I spent a long time thinking I'd crush my personality, but nothing you can do about it. <laughs> it manages to, comes out. if you press it, it's like pressing, 
you know, who we are. I remember, that, who is it, the American guru, Randa, someone said, what's it like years and years, you know, you've been practicing for years, what's it like? And I think it's a very good simile. And he said, well, when I was young, I lived in a very crowded apartment. And he, of course, he's referring to his mind, for those who... So I lived in a very crowded apartment. The fridge was here. The television was here. Record player was right here. Very crowded. He said, I've still got all that furniture. He said, but now I live in an aircraft hangar. And I think it's a very good simile for what happens over the years. We gradually... Our environment expands, our, our building, the walls start to move out, and then we start to be able to see the, the space in the room, our mind, we start to perceive mind. And it can get to a point when we see people, we see space, not only the space around people, but the people are in space, suspended in space. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> but it starts to go that way, you know. And we know we, we know we develop because of our relationship with our experience and the friends in the monastery. I remember when I first went to, I think I've told this story, when I first went to Thailand and there was a tall, very good looking tall, well first there was a Thai novices who used to, you know, I was a 44-year-old 40, Anagaraka, you know, and then when I sat there and I'd had a business and, you know, all that, I knew my stuff in the world. And uh, then I get to Nana Chat and I get this little novice come up, about 10, and he goes, don't sit there, sit there. Don't put that there, put it there. <laughs> You know, sort of broken tie. And the inclination was to sort of, when nobody's looking, just... But <laughs> 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 you gradually learn this is... <laughs> in Sri Lanka, well, we need to know this one. Uh, and I love the, I, you know, I love the ties. I love the Sri Lankans. But they've got a habit, you know, you could go to a place, you can go to a little place where a person's never come out of the village, you know, and then they speak English and then... You'll start to speak and they'll say, oh, you don't know Bunty. You don't know Bunty. So now I sort of say, yeah, I don't know. You better tell me. <laughs> but I remember when I first went to Nana Chat, there was this tall German, and he was a, he was a, um, um, a salmon era. I was just becoming a salmon era. And he was a bit like that. I thought, well, this guy is so arrogant, you know. And it's funny, I suppose, I suppose I had to see him vulnerable for it to work, you know, so <laughs> it's a bit of an admission, is that um, he then later on, and I remember when we were making our robes, you know, he says, I'm going to make the best Sangati, you know, and he was, it took a long time making his Sangati. And then, of course, he left it in his, and come, we park a being what it is, and the world has ways of teaching us. You know, the, <laughs> you don't get away with anything. So he put his sangati neatly in a corner and left his kuti for a while. And the rats came in, ate great big holes in it. <laughs> so when he turned up, his sangati had patches in it and all that from the rats. <laughs> Which I didn't glee. I tried not to glee. But, but then later on, he, I was in a place with him and he got, he thought he'd got malaria, brain malaria, but there's a falciborum. What's brain malaria called? It's falciborum, isn't it? Brain malaria? I think it's called falciborum. Which is pretty dodgy. And then, um, you know, you can die of it. And the symptoms are like rabies-type symptoms. And I suddenly saw this vulnerable side of him. <laughs> and it's like my heart burst, you know. And we became the closest and dearest friends. And every time we would go, and he didn't have malaria, it was just paranoia, basically. <laughs> He's just paranoid. You know, when you think you've got brain, brain malaria, it's very easy to become paranoid. You know, when you've got a, when you've got a centipede in your sabong, it's very easy to become paranoid. And uh, so whenever we were going to another monastery, we'd always meet on the porch of his kuti and have a coffee together. 
and uh, and I say he actually disrobed. And he came here once years after, and he looked really tired and worn out. I felt very sorry for him. But there's there's monks who, in the beginning, you know, perhaps didn't get on so well with, and um, not didn't get on. Not, you know, I didn't hate them or anything like that. It's just that we were different types of people, and then. But then years after, I'd see them, and then there's a natural affection for them because you've all gone through the same experience. You've all had the same experience. So I think I think for for whether you're going to become a monk or if you become a monk or a nun, and even if you disrobe after, I think it's you know at some time or something like that. I think it's the more I see of the world and everything like that, the more I turn the TV on, you know, and I do what, you know, if I'm with my family, the TV's on, I watch. I'm a bit of a news, a news buff. I don't turn away from it. And uh, the whole impact of it is, in one way, it's perfect. You know, it's the way it is, the way of the world, it's the Kama Loka, and it's perfect. I remember, I think it was at Ram Dass when he met his teacher, his teacher said to him, Nim Karoli Baba, he said, and I've got a bit of a soft spot for Ram Dass. Some people don't like him. Some things he said, I'm not. he's dead now, bless him. But I think he was, he was well liked. And he's, he gave a talk in the early 1970s called Seasons of Our Lives. And it's actually a beautiful, he had two talks called Seasons of Our Lives. But one of them is particularly good, really good talk. Um, but he said, uh, you know, when he used to always teach, he's Neem Karoli Baba, he, Neem Karoli Sabi, he said, uh, you've got to work full time to end suffering. There's all this suffering in the world. And he thought, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got to end all this suffering. Then a little while later, he'd look at Ram Dass and he'd say, don't you see it's all perfect? And that's how it is. You've got to understand, even though we complain about the world and the wars, this is the way it is. There is a perfection about it. With the, even with the suffering, because this is what this world is about, and it's an illu it's illusion. Doesn't mean that you can get away with anything, because there's actual laws we have to work with. Just lately, I finish in a minute. Just lately, I've decided I'm going to pump. Like last talk, I started talking about precepts, because these talks do go out public. So I started talking about precepts, and, but someone pointed out after I kept using the expression sila, and a lot of people wouldn't know the expression sila. So now I say precepts, you know, because there's a way to function in order for, in order for us to um, mature in the world. And I mentioned this in the last time I spoke because I think it's so important in this time is that outside so much talk about mindfulness and no talk about precepts and sila and people think they can be mindful doing anything you know as long as I'm mindful and without sila there's no illumination to the mind like a computer we're like a computer to get the right thing you have to put in the same, you have to put in the certain things. Like, can you work in for the conditions of the computer in order to get the result? We know ultimately there's no good or bad. There's just quantum mechanics. We're all quantum mechanics. But on the conventional level, there's certain ways of functioning. If we want to see the nature of things, if we want to be able to have a clearer view, see mindfulness without sila, without this element of. Um, Precepts is just attention, paying attention. A safe breaker has brilliant attention, brilliant concentration, but his mind's full of greed, hatred, and delusion. What the precepts do is that they clear the mind of the greed, hatred, and delusion. We're all deluded to an extent, we wear glasses. But the greed and the hate, this, this removes them. So then the mind takes on a, a, a brighter, clearer view. It doesn't become a light bulb, <laughs> but it becomes clearer. And then if we've got a teaching like the Buddha or whatever good religion, you know, you've got Jesus, the teachings of Jesus. I mean, my wife's a devout Christian. She refers to her heart as the God-shaped void. It's very beautiful. 
you know. And she's got a very impeccable sealer. You know, and she, and in actual fact, years ago, I hope she doesn't listen to this, but um, I remember Jane Semedo when, when, you know, it was, she was Christian, Jane Semedo, this was years ago, he said, you know, Rosemary, she looks kind of Christian. She's got a Christianness about her, you know, fair, fair and kind of radiantly Christian y sort of side about her. I said, yeah, blooming Christians. <laughs> We don't try to convert each other. I have to watch myself. Because you know? <laughs> to me, the Christian, the cross represents. Someone came to me and said, you know, Jesus wasn't born. He didn't die on the cross, one of these alternative things. He came down and he married, married Madeline and I don't know, they lived in France or something. And then the Crusaders, they're an extension of it. The Knights Templar are part of the Christian tradition. I said, it's all garbage to me. <laughs> I said, the cross represents Dukkha. And him on the cross represents the, the uh, transcendent and the five hindrances, and the last one being doubt, Abba, Abba. So I said, it's symbolic. It's got, no, I don't care whether he lived in Broadstairs or Bournemouth. <laughs> You know, it's got nothing to do with it. I said, it's just the spiritual, the spiritual side. But, um, yeah, so I have to be a bit careful if I talk about things like that. Yeah, so I was, yeah, so that's where we're different. We do dress all the same. So we're all in a uniform, dressing up the same as all the people of all the different diversities and identities, whether they want to be a crocodile, a cat, or a, what they're not. You know, they're all doing it. But it, then it's, a, it's this. It's still this, you know. Somebody came to me and said, do you know, it's a thought that perhaps the Buddha was non-binary. I said, it's nonsense. <laughs> he was transcendental, because non-binary. I don't identify with anything. There's still an identity. <laughs> it's still an identity. I remember when I was a kind of in my hippie phase, going to the Albert Hall, and I was a fan of American rock band, Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention. And uh, there's a there's a double album from the Albert Hall. I can and I'm on that in one of the audience because <laughs> I remember all the hippies then and then. These guys come down in their uniforms, telling people where to sit and everything like that. Because all the hippies start. If ever you've been to the Albert Hall, it gets pretty crowded. You know, you've got Albert Hall full of hippies. They're all screaming, "Get their uniforms off! Get their uniforms off!" <laughs> and Frank Zappa was pretty wise in his way. Came to the and I, it's on it's on the double album actually. I haven't heard it for about forty years, but I know it's on. He comes forward and he said. Everybody in this room's wearing a uniform. Don't kid yourself. Which I thought, that's it. You tell them, Frank. <laughs> you wear a uniform. But our uniform is a method. A method of being nobody in particular. Particular? Particular? <laughs> particular. Going about our duties. Keeping our precepts. Watching our mind. Letting go. Letting go, seeing their reaction, letting go, being kind, feeding the stray cat, you know, being good to each other. And at times when you think, boy, oh, this is really difficult, especially if you. Younger, younger. When you're my age, you see, you ain't got so long to go. It's one thing with the news. I sat there with my wife and we looked at the news. And my wife, both of us got to say to go, oh, not long to go. <laughs> not long to go. <laughs> we ain't got to put up with this nonsense too much. Now I might get reborn now. So. Someone said, where do I want to be born if I get be born on earth? I said, I want to be born in Berkhampstead in a nice middle-class family. So I see the monks on Bindabar, and hopefully when I'm a little boy, I think, oh, they look familiar. I think I'll go up there and have a look. 
And because I used to like dressing up, so I think, oh, I'd like to be one of them. <laughs> so that's what we are, becoming useless, wisely useless. There's another story. I finish off with another little one about the, the governor of Kyoto went to see the Zen. There were Zen stories, you see. No, no, I tell you. <laughs> The, he's supposed to have heard all these. The, the, the governor of Kyoto goes to the Zen master, and the man comes to the door, the attendant, so he gives him the card. It's got a card, Kagoshi, governor of Kyoto. So he takes this to the Zen master, and the Zen master goes, Oh, Kagoshi, governor of Kyoto, I don't know this man. Send him away. So the the... Attendant goes back and he gives the card back to the the Kagaji, the, the governor of Kyoto. And he says, he doesn't know you. And so he's quite wise. So Kagaji looks at the Oh, I see, I see the mistake. So he gets his pen out and he scrubs out, governor of Kyoto. So he says, give that back to him. So then he takes it back and the Zen master looks at him and says, Oh, Kagaji, I've been waiting to see that fellow. <laughs> Once he went there as governor of Kyoto, no opening. Once he then went just of Kagoshi, he was open. So I finished that. Bless you all. <laughs>